for discussion, so please feel free to stay and talk to us then. We are honoured to have two amazing speakers with us today, both global experts in their fields, Professor Kate Fletcher and Jojo Mehta. I invite Katie to give some brief background information about both speakers just now. Thanks, Karen. Um, we're delighted to have you both here today. Welcome, thank you for coming. Um, professor Kate Fletcher is a research professor, author, consultant and design activist. Her systemic approach to sustainable textiles has made her a pioneer in this field, honouring both environmental and social justice in the production and afterlife of all worn apparel. Professor Fletcher is the most cited scholar in the field of fashion and sustainability, having written 70 publications, including nine books of her own, as well as co-editing and co-authoring further academic texts. As well as her academic work at the University of the Arts London, Professor Fletcher sits on a range of committees and has acted as an advisor to the all-party parliamentary group on ethics and sustainability in fashion at the House of Lords. Jojo Mehta co-founded Stop Ecoside with the late Scottish barrister and legal pioneer Polly Higgins. She is executive director of Stop Ecoside International, chair of the charitable Stop Ecoside Foundation, and convener of the independent expert panel for the legal definition of ecocide, chaired by Philippe Sands QC and Senegalese magistrate Dior Falstow. Jojo has overseen the remarkable growth of the ecocide movement with, with teams in 15 countries across six continents and websites in nine languages, while coordinating between legal development, diplomatic traction and public narrative. This rapidly growing conversation means that recognition of ecocide as a crime is now emerging as a key potential solution to address the climate and ecological crises. Thank you both, Karen. So I think you can see why we're so excited to be here today and to be part of this conversation. But before we, be, we hear from Professor Kate Fletcher, I wonder if we might take a moment to pause and to ground ourselves firmly in this space. Online events are particularly vulnerable to interruptions or to the temptations to multitask, whether you're present now or watching a film of this event in the future. I invite you in this moment to consider what nature means to you, whether it's something that's separate from you or is within you. I wonder if you're able that you might place your feet on the ground and be aware of the earth below. Perhaps under layers of concrete and wood, but somewhere below the earth is supporting us. And as you feel the stability of the earth below you, know that being planted on the ground allows your upper body to be lighter. Now take a deep breath and another, noticing if this allows your body to relax, if it releases the tension that's already built up today. This is nature supporting us. This is nature within us. We are in nature and nature is in us. And for the next 50 minutes, we'll consider how our clothes can be part of nature's healing to learn how we can be part of a solution and help nature to heal through the way we do life. The clothes we buy, wear and dispose of, the businesses we support through our purchases, the laws that we endorse that become policies to change the way we do life. I now welcome Professor Kate Fletcher to this conversation. Thank you, Karen. Hi, everybody. Good morning. And that's such a beautiful way uh, to start. I have a short presentation with some visuals, so I'm just going to share my screen now. Great. So it's a real pleasure uh, to be here today. So I wanted to start by telling you a little bit about what happened when I attended uh, a discussion meeting at Cambridge University a few years ago. So a, a group of us, and they included engineers, theologians, uh, designers, psychologists, sociologists, 
these people, we were all gathered there to grapple with a very thorny question. So in this current era of climate change, uh, biodiversity decline and a growing human population, how do we reduce the environmental impact of producing and consuming materials, including those, of course, that end up in the clothes that we wear? So the closing remarks of this meeting were very pithy, you might say. So the first was that, yes, technology is good at reducing impacts but it has very real limits to its ability to improve things. And we're pretty much at those limits at the moment. Yet still, somehow, a techno fix dream still permeates society. The only solution this group of experts said is less stuff. There aren't any other options. So there is perhaps no part of contemporary life that reflects consumer culture more than the fashion sector. And the language of the consumer society in the clothes that we wear and buy is so overriding that we hardly even notice it. It's like normal to take part in fashion primarily by going shopping for new garments. It's expected that these same garments will look stylistically sort of incongruous, outdated in just a few months. And it's usual, of course, we know this, but to discard rather than repair. Indeed, buying new clothes and getting rid of existing ones has become an established component of modern living. And we tell ourselves that this is a story in which progress is synonymous with economic growth, with buying more, with shopping, including for new clothes. And a theme running through this idea is more and cheaper. And in the first decade of the 21st century, clothing prices in Europe fell by a quarter in real terms. And in that same period in the UK, we bought 20% more clothes. Um, this of course comes at a cost. And today it's estimated that 20% of global industrial water pollution comes from textile dyeing and finishing. And more than 60% of all clothing ends up in incinerators or landfills within a year. Over the last two decades, a massive amount of work has been done to try to counter pollution and other impacts associated with clothes. And this has led to a real sense of change. Yet, in that same time, the amount of clothing, the volume, total volume of clothing has increased. And any attempts that we've made to lessen the impact of the fashion sector have been completely outstripped by the fact that now there are more garments in circulation. The metric that matters here is the impact of the system as a whole. And this shows that things are getting worse, not better. This is a, a chart that's from um, at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, and it says, I mean, something that we could probably guess, that the number of units, when as that increases, the number of times we wear each garment we have reduces. I mean, it's sort of obvious, isn't it? But this sort of challenge of more and of uh, reducing costs isn't a challenge that we can solve simply by continuing to fine tune the offer of the fashion industry as we know it. This isn't something that's achievable by efficiency improvements. And it's a challenge because it, you can't do this. It's a challenge with much deeper roots, with roots in the underlying ideas and structures that influence the activities of the fashion sector as a whole. And this of course impacts things how, like how we live our lives and what is happening with the climate. But these structures, these underpinning structures are things that we can change. These structures also require us to think about how we can reduce demand for materials. This may feel a bit of a red flag, this idea of perhaps less and reduction. It may run counter to the priorities that maybe you or maybe constituents in Scotland have. 
around job retention, around livelihoods. But what we see is that environmental quality is higher where income is more equally distributed. So where there are different sorts of priorities, what we know is that environmental quality is higher where people are more literate, where, where civil and political rights are better respected. What we see is environmental quality is higher when people power, not economic growth per se, becomes the focus of our projects, of our legislation. The priorities of the environment and those of citizens are inevitably interconnected, two sides of the same coin. And we need to begin to find ways to talk about less alongside life choices for people in new and different ways. The good news, I suppose, is some of us are already doing this. For more than five years, I gathered stories from the public in three different continents about how they use clothing, about what fashion is and what opportunities for apparel might be when they're not confined to the idea of fashion as shopping. I suppose what I was interested in was the widespread but very little appreciated skills, ideas, behaviours and tools associated with using clothing, with maintaining them, with keeping them going and wearing them over time. I was interested in this because using things is not based on, not dependent on producing and consuming more. Because use and ongoing use is actually a route to less. So I'm going to tell you a few of these stories now. So this is a garment that was brought along to a photo shoot in Melbourne, Australia. And it's a piece that the, the owner of it can wear in many different ways. But she only realised that she appreciated its versatility after she'd worn it many times. The point being, I suppose, that in order to appreciate the potential of what we already own, we first need to use them over and over again. So there's a different sort of requirement here for time and our relationship with garments. This is a, a, a waistcoat as it started out. This, this chap who lives around the corner from where I live in the north of England um, brought this along and he said it started out as a waistcoat, which was quite narrow fitting. But then he put some weight on and could no longer fasten it up the front. So he took a pair of scissors and slit this waistcoat up the back and knitted a panel and inserted it in the back of his waistcoat. And then he said he carried on wearing it for a while and then thought, you know, what this needs is some sleeves, a waistband and a collar. And so he made these and then added them to this jacket, which then became rather than a waistcoat, a jacket carried on wearing it and then over time he said yeah, I'll put some more weight on I couldn't fasten it up the front any longer so then he added what he described as latchets sort of small pieces of leather across the front which he added each one with us we finished each one with a sequin the knowledge and the skills that a man like this not a tailor just an ordinary citizen the knowledge and the skills that people have to open up a garment and adjust it to fit, contribute to a really rich and confident society. They remind us about ingenuity and resourceful possibility. And I suppose what they do is they help replace consumption with action. Evidence suggests that these things, using things fully and with pleasure, satisfies many of the same needs we try to meet when we buy new goods. And this, as a different example, was brought to a photo shoot in London. It was an old purchase, not made from an ethical brand, but its wearer saw that in dressing in it for more than 30 years, he'd sort of made it ethical. he changed the values. What's important here is that he didn't crack open his sewing box and think, oh, I'm going to set to with a needle and thread. Instead, he changed the thinking that he has about the clothing he already owns. And this, a woman in her 80s and her three daughters and two granddaughters who competitively wear the same dress. Perhaps what all this is pointing to is that things of course need maintaining and tending no less than buying and creating. And what we've done up to this point is focus very narrowly on what fashion activity is. But here we have an opportunity to broaden our sense of what is important and begin to invest 
and talk about clothes in a much more integrated way. I suppose what I'm trying to suggest is that we follow the lead that was taken by Einstein and Kuhn uh, regarding thinking about the approach that we take. We have to transcend the paradigm that we're currently working within, which creates the problems that we're facing. And, and we have to do that, otherwise we'll just replicate the same problems in every idea that we have going forward. So maybe what we're saying here is that we need instead to prioritize new ideas, perhaps something like usership, which ties into the core economy in new and different ways. It's a core economy that is based in households, it comes first. It's about prioritizing the sustaining of the essentials of family, social care, empathy, teaching, reciprocity. I suppose it's also, it's fashion with dignity, with opportunity, community within planetary limits. Historically, governments, of course, have opted to tax what they could rather than what they should. Um, and certainly when we, you need to get the beat of a system, something like fashion, we need to watch it, we need to know how it works, pay attention to the value of what's already there if we're going to begin to think about how to intervene. What we know at the moment is, and this is a, a challenging message I, I accept, that is that growth uh, and the economic growth doesn't clean up environmental harms frequently. We're encouraged just to do more business activity because that will enable us to invest in more environmental projects. But what we know is that it doesn't clean up environmental harms. If anything, it just spreads them out. Because as national economies have got larger, so too have their global material footprints, ratcheting up the pressures on climate change, on water scarcity, on ocean acidification, biodiversity loss, chemical pollution, and so on and so forth. And so I suppose if we were to think about what are these stories of the everyday use of clothing, of ideas of maybe thinking about less as a priority within Scotland, is what would we do in terms of policy recommendations? And I think that there's lots of very interesting work and scope to think about how to facilitate maintenance and associated ongoing use of garments and to find ways to bring that into law. For example, certainly in, in, um, in Westminster, there have been discussions about trying to make VAT services, uh, sorry, repair services VAT exempt in order to begin to change the emphasis of cost uh, away from the new garments being cheaper to, to hopefully finding some ways to incentivize people to repair. There's other things around practical skills associated with repair of all goods, including clothing, bicycles, computers, and so on and so forth. That should be mandated as part of school curricula. Uh, and then there are other potential ideas. In a, is there a way that we can uh, incentivize uh, or recommend that fashion magazines, for instance, carry at least one photo shoot of garments that have been already worn for more than five years? So that a visual language is developed of acceptability and ongoing use of clothing rather than this total emphasis on new and more. Anyway, there's so much to say, but I'm going to stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Just going to open up the floor for five minutes discussion just now. Um, and yeah, wondering if if any MSPs would like to, policymakers would like to make, ask questions. Hi, it's Rachel Hamilton. Hi, thank you for that, Kate. Um, I represent a constituency called Ettrick, Roxburgh and Berwickshire. It's in the Scottish borders. You will know it for um, having a, um, a massive uh, presence on the stage of the textile industry. Um, the cashmere industry is very strong here, as well as, um, you know, weaving, dyeing and finishing. And it obviously you referenced um, the reliance on a lot of industry in, in terms of jobs. I suppose it's just to really make the point that, you know, we know that these industries use high amounts of energy and water uh, and indeed chemicals as well. But I suppose um, without sort of, I think it's a transition I think I wanted to make a point that this is about transition and this is about sort of a, 
a long term aim and objective to transition some of these industries into perhaps, uh, you know, using more environmentally uh, friendly and sustainable methods. But I think that will take um, that that does, doesn't take policy that takes sort of um, investment in capital technology innovation um, and actually skilling up people in, in new ways. But the other point I want to make is that the industry is actually already quite sustainable in the fact that a person would buy one jumper rather than buy a one tartan skirt or jacket rather than multiple numbers um, at, at a low cost from say ASOS. And uh, you know, the, the thing is, is that it's about the affordability as well. And that jacket can then be um, used in many other ways or passed down through generations as you've suggested. Um, but it, at the initial point of purchase, it's actually quite a lot of money because we know that it's from um, a good quality source. It's been procured in a, in a good way. There's so many questions here. And I mean, I, I just want to make the point that I don't want to undermine what is a really important industry here. Um, and I'm willing to sort of listen and talk and, and work alongside um, anyone that has any suggestions, really. Thanks, Rachel. Kate, would you like to make a short comment? We've got two other MSPs with their hands up. I mean, you're, you're, I, I take your point uh, totally about uh, a transition process. Perhaps what we would say is that uh, for more than 30 years, people have been engaging in uh, uh, efficiency drives and improvements within this sector. And at the moment, we would say that the global impact of the fashion sector is getting worse uh, in all of the planetary uh, metrics that we use, not better. And so even though in a small, in a regional context, it may seem that it's not, it's not the problem that you're facing globally, it is a sort of problem that needs a different sort of dialogue around. So maybe what we need is to have a conversation about some of the global purpose and what's going on here because I think that that would help tie in all of these narratives better. And what we see in terms of cost, what you're saying is, is totally right. So cost is a really good way to help people to commit to a product over time. That's been well shown. Price is a really important way to do that. But there are many other parts of the fashion sector that are growing exponentially in this space. And we're trying to figure out how we bring the whole sector together in that. And I accept that you're representing your constituency where there's different sorts of questions. But I will go on to talk a little about, a bit about local adaptation and the significance of thinking uh, regionally about this in, um, in a few minutes. So perhaps that, that could be a conversation that we continue. Thanks, Kate. Monica. Thank you so much. I think Rachel covered so much. Um, probably some of my questions have been addressed. I think for me, it's about how we can um, look at the challenges around affordability, um, because we know that it's the, the people um, who have the least, you know, who have the most limited choices. And there's a lot of stigma about, um, you know, pre-loved clothing. So I think if you're higher income, it seems to be quite cool to be um, you know, buying, investing in pre-loved pieces, but if you're for a poorer, from a poorer income background, there can be a stigma around that. So we've got to try and challenge these cultural issues. Um, I suppose what I'm thinking is, um, as we try and recover the economy from the pandemic, there will be a lot of political pressure to encourage people to get out to the high street, to go shopping and to consume more. Um, I think that's the messaging that the public will be hearing. So what would you like to hear us say and do in the Scottish Parliament to, of course, encourage people to support their local economies, but to do that in a more sustainable way, as you say, within those uh, planetary limits, Kate? Thanks, Monica. Kate? That's a brilliant Brilliant question, because actually that gets to the heart of so, so much here, because it's full of uh, all of these really difficult trade-offs. I mean, class, you're right, is, is a really critical part of this. And uh, questions, for example, around many, for, many justifications for, the, for cheaper clothes, for fast fashion items, are around um, providing access to, to goods and to fashion experiences for, for the poorest people in society. And it's often 
framed in terms of a, a democratic, a democratizing fashion. But actually, it doesn't really give the people, the poorest people, any control over the means of production. It's not that at all. It's just choosing from a very pre selected number of items. But it's certainly true that there's very little cultural capital that people feel over fashion from lots of different, um, different backgrounds, particularly lower class backgrounds. I, I'm from Liverpool originally, and, I, and I'm from a working class community. So they, those sorts of issues are, are central to me. But back to your specific question, I think. Uh, for me, the big question here is about finding ways to really support fashion activities that help really benefit our communities. So most of fashion activity, which I'll go on to speak about in a minute, is, 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 is supported by a very globalised sector, where all of the benefit is almost immediately sucked out of the community and goes to a large globalised sector. So it's about finding ways that we can try to invest in something that really gets to the, the core of our communities and to identify which sorts of shopping behaviours, if that's what's been being encouraged, will do that. And to decipher between those is extremely difficult, but perhaps that's what we need to be doing is thinking about, okay, so how can we do that? How can we support our communities through the specific choices that we make? It's a huge amount of work, for example, that's been done around local currencies that find those as a very effective mechanism to doing something like that. So I'm not saying that that's the only thing, but there are ways that we can use money and trade and, and economics very effectively within spaces like this, particularly in a short to medium term sort of uh, frame. Thanks, Kate. Martin and Michelle, I see your hands are raised. If you don't mind, um, I'm going to let Kate give her second presentation. And if you could hold on to those questions, um, definitely we'll have time to ask them after Kate's next presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Kate. Just opening. Great. Okay, so this is really tying in um, with some of the things that we've just been talking about. So, as I'm sure you're all already familiar with, the fashion industry is particularly fluid and mobile. And over the last 30 years, uh, it's fundamentally changed both the scales and I think also the intelligibility of its operation. It's um, Apparel companies have shifted uh, their manufacturing facilities to the lowest wage countries overseas in order to minimize costs. And this is a picture that's been sort of, the wheels of this have been greased by international trade quotas being lifted and the easing of caps and restrictions. And I think what we ultimately see that through this time, the most of the conventional approaches that the fashion sector has implemented to try to affect change just haven't in any fundamental way affected the political and economic forces that have been shaping the fashion culture. And I think this is where we're at now. We're thinking in different ways about what fashion can be, but by also thinking in terms of the political and fashion structures that shape what we go on to do. So localism uh, may or may not be something that lights things up uh, for you, but what it is, is an alternative that is being mooted and is generally within the uh, environmental movement. It's offered as, as pretty much one of the most uh, convincing solutions to many of the issues that we face. And what it is, it involves the shaping of activity by a region's natural features and by also what's intriguing and dynamic in a place in order to ensure, ensure its long-term prosperity. So much of the industry that was based in the Scottish border is there partly because of some of the, the water that's available, access to, to, to wool that's available in those regions. So it's always and already shaped by those things. But the promise of localism as an alternative strategy is a way that we can begin to uh, maybe unlock some of these challenges arises from two main sources. First, 
the different way that power is divided when we revise the scale of living downwards. So when we work at smaller scales, we change the influence that people have over decisions that affect their lives. So that's the first thing. And the second is that a community's well-being depends on the health of the, the ecology, of the ecosystem that it lives within. And that same community is uniquely placed to understand and affect that system. So we're hoping here that local people make decisions that best benefit their lives. So ideas of localism, they rest on a very simple hierarchy that promotes a local community and the land on which it's based above um, the economy. Um, and environmental and community priorities here dictate the ambition of industry. I think what we're seeing is we see diverse, distinct economic and social structures in these smaller communities, and they tend to be, become to be sitting alongside, or even in some cases replacing, globalised homogenous ones. And often such things, uh, they don't always lead to the sorts of solutions that are particularly easy to understand. They don't necessarily represent the long term for the best because they're based on like local people's decisions and they come with all the flaws that that happens. And they're also a community's joint responsibility. So they're not necessarily the things that we would pick, but they're things that come from within the place. So local, localism effect is effectively a centre people movement, which is concentrating economic and political power inside a community, whereas globalisation moves everything the other way. Maybe what this teaches us is that place really matters. And if we can start from understanding the places in which we are and building our uh, fashion and textile industries and opportunities from there, that begins to give shape to a fashion activity that we've lost recently. And that people and communities begin to evolve within the unique natural and social assets of where they are. I suppose what I'm saying is it holds promise for a different sort of change in fashion culture characterized by community priorities, characterized by a different sort of stewardship of resources that then begin to lead the bigger global conversation on what's important. Um, critically, localism isn't just about regional manufacturing and decentralized distribution of you know, local regional tiers of uh, uh, industry production it includes this, but it's other things too. And um, it's not just traditional fiber, it's not just heritage pieces or tweed or country wear, it's something more than this. It's all of the activity that happens in a community. And this may feel that I'm banging on about all these sort of unseen parts of what fashion is, but it is the case. So I live near Macclesfield in the north of England, and we had. Uh, well, historically a very strong textile industry, so almost none of it left now. But this is really important that we see this whole picture because we're trying to understand the cumulative effects. We're trying to build understanding so we can take responsibility. We're trying to see localism as garments, as the things that people do with their clothes, as production, as people, as place, including the unpopular bits. Um, because the reality, including in a town like Macclesfield and many of the towns I'm sure that are similar to that up and down uh, the UK is uh, it's not really very pretty uh, what I see when I look around here you know we've got sheep grazing on the hillsides just outside the town you can see them from the town centre but there's no locally grown fibre available. Macclesfield's like local fashion resources are the things that you buy in charity shops. Uh, if fashion culture is a reflection of the places in which we live. How can we make our places differently to change how we dress? This, I suppose, broadens the conversation so that we're thinking more about community in place and also fashion as part of that. Fashion is a social product. It's a way to create community. It's a way to improve culture and nature. And this is the challenge. There's so much of the visible activity that's going on, the stuff that we see, the stuff that's industry led, but it's actually supported by a hidden 
almost a subterranean network of things that we do that makes what goes on above ground possible. And what I would say is that we have to really think about when we're growing regional ideas around this is that we have to pay attention to the root system, this hidden set of activities that the sorts of knowledge that we have, the community work that we do that goes on around the communities that we live. If this work was only about products, then it would be largely advocated for uh, by the market and facilitated by business, but it's actually also about the practices and about fashion culture that we that currently has no advocates for that. And so actually what we need to do when we think about regional uh, fashion and textiles is we need to think in multiple ways. We need to think about advocating not only of the stuff that we can see, but also all of this culture that's hidden underneath that we also need to support. So some of the recommendations that are thought about for regional um, fashion activity include the economic incentives being put in place to introduce the very small scale decentralized manufacturing of fashion and textiles, which have specific criteria which recognize the place adaptation is vital. So recognizing local resources, climate, skills, dress practices, and also maybe investing at the same time in a program that cultivates a more diverse, more local self-reliant fashion culture that's distinctive in Scotland and maybe the regions of Scotland, one to the other, and resisting this pull towards globalization because here we begin to build a very different engagement with what fashion is. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, Martin and Michelle, you had your hands up. Would one of you like to speak first? Um, re it, it, absolutely fascinating. And I, you know, I, I compliment you on the discovery of the complexity of the situation. I think people have a view of fashion as, as an oversimplistic thing. I was going to ask you about the, the role of quality of material product in that. Um, I think about the situation, particularly with young people in the area that I live in, of the handing down of school uniform and the passing on and how a few years ago, items of clothing, even the hands of children would last a, a good length of time, but that's completely been replaced by as cheap as possible, one term, one year, and then dispose. And I wonder whether you can comment, not just with regard to, to school clothing, but generally with regard to the quality of the material, which I think ties into what Rachel was saying as well about the quality of product in localized areas um, is often much higher than the worldwide comment. And the other thing I was going to ask was about whether or what research has been done with regard to the demographics of the people involved in that. To pick up on Monica's point about, you know, at the end of the day, um, there is huge social pressure to have the current fashion. And I think particularly of teenagers and I think particularly in shoes, in, in trainers, um, which causes huge conflict and huge upset. And I wonder whether you could also comment then on about this developed idea of almost a worldwide fashion rather than the, what you're hinting at, which is very regional and indeed almost community um, fashion being the lead. And that conflict between the way young people in particular see mainstream media presentation of fashion and what perhaps really should be fashion. Thank you. Yeah. So quality question first. So uh, sometimes it's described as the quality fade, this, this change in quality levels from more in our memories at least, and certainly with the, the uniforms that we probably wore as, as children, and then now to, to what um, uh, is available at the moment. And this has been fueled by many things, including uh, super low cost clothing. Uh, that now has become the norm. So also there's, a, there's an expectation or there's, there's an assumption that people expect no better than that they're being given. And so then people just sort of accept what's being given. So this is, this is a problem. So this is like, um, this is like a, a fiber led or a fabric led or a product led technical problem that prevents uh, reuse or cycles of use. And 
it's plainly really, really important. And yet, uh, as with everything, as, as you said about the complexity of this, it, it ain't as simple as that. Because what we also see is that if something, even if it's hanging together by a thread, people will continue wearing it if they want to wear it that way. So it's coupled with a, an, um, an appetite to keep wearing things that we need to cultivate, not only material robustness and really good making quite standards and large seams and things so that people can adjust them. Absolutely, that's part of it. But there's this other narrative around a, an, an acceptance or an expectation that that is what we will do. Uh, as well. And of course, this sits completely at odds with this massive marketing machine that is uh, fashion businesses that are pushing through as many goods as they can. So it's tied to multiple agendas all at the same time. And then the pressure on young people uh, to curate images of themselves, which are constantly new and present these on social media is, is, is massive. So it's really tied together in ways that need to be um, held together because if you try to take, deal with them separately of course you'll never sort of figure it out if you try to patch it back together but yes the pressure on increasing consumption and experimentation through uh, image and through appearance is colossal and fashion is part of that story but fashion itself historically um, the, uh, the origin of the word and the idea, it was never uh, our experience of it now. So originally it was making uh, things together in groups. So originally its origin it, it is, is in making and making things in communities and in groups. So if we were to sort of understand the, both the power of what fashion is and try to mobilize that and maybe to honor other ideas of what fashion could be, it could be completely reframed. But yeah, I mean, the pressure on young people is 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 colossal. It's insane. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, <clears throat> Michelle, I'm still aware that you have a question to ask, but um, as time's going on, I'm just going to introduce Jojo to speak to us just now. And there will be time at the end of Jojo's uh, presentation for uh, another question or two. Thank you so much, Jojo. Thank you. And what a fan fantastic and fascinating uh, forum to be in. Um, I, I mostly am focusing um, on very kind of top level international legal side of things. Um, and listening to Kate and to all the questions really has made me um, it's been such an opportunity to hone in on a particular instance or industry where what we're working on in terms of criminalizing mass destruction of nature um, has has a really uh, important relevance. Um, and I think, I mean, Kate touched on, you know, a number of times on how the problems that, you know, the fashion that we're facing with this sustainability and, and um, the fashion industry are really systemic um, and that, you know, they have quite deep roots. and. I think that uh, what we're working on at the Stop Eastside Foundation and this growing movement is addressing not so much all the different ways that game can be played and improved in, in, in a given industry, but actually what the ground rules are by which we're allowed to play. Um, and so that is where we where we focus. And you know, the, our campaign was, I, I co-founded this with a UK lawyer who's no, no longer with us, Polly Higgins, uh, back in 2017, um, with the specific legal aim of introducing an, a crime at the international level of ecocide, um, which is, is sort of broadly understood to be the mass damage and destruction of nature. Um, and we would add to that, you know, committed recklessly, in other words, with knowledge of the risks, since in this day and age, um, it's actually quite hard for key decision makers to claim that they are not aware of the potential implications of the projects they decide to engage in. Um, and so we do see this as a kind of systemic intervention and it's it's highly relevant to the fashion industry because as Kate outlined you know there's a, you know a, a really significant percentage of pollution globally that the textiles and clothing industry is responsible for um, and there, there's this kind of um, sort of 
paradoxical thing um, that has been encouraged, I have to say, by the what 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 Kate described as the massive marketing machine, um, which is which somehow um, lays in the laps of consumers um, the you know the, it. it the, the choice of where they go in terms of what they buy and in terms of what's uh, you know what, what is therefore produced and so on um, and you know we would say that that's that's actually rather misleading I mean I, the example I usually use is not so much in fashion but it but, but it could equally apply there um, I, I use the example of, of cars in the sense that I live in a rural area I drive a car my car is a fossil fuel car not because I want to drive a fossil fuel car I can't afford an electric one um, and you know that ultimately that decision it, it traces back to you know the billions of dollars of subsidies that go towards fossil fuels um, and the policy decisions that don't support alternatives and I believe that this, you know, a similar parallel could also be made with, um, you know, with the, with the textile industry and, and, and other industries too, other sectors too. Um, and so what, what we sort of aim to do with this, uh, with introducing a new international crime is to effectively create a kind of a parameter, almost like a, a safety rail. Um, because you know the, the the crisis that we're now facing globally, the challenge that we're now facing globally in terms of climate and ecology, it is actually very difficult to overstate it. You know, it, it, we're now hearing from so many different um, directions that this decade, that you know, the, the, uh, between now and twenty thirty, is going to be really decisive in terms of moving the whole uh, sort of global culture and economy towards a sustainability and ultimately towards what we sincerely hope will be a thriving situation in a very different mode in other words currently the you know recent decades of you know our approach to nature which is very much of a kind of you know extractivist you know treating nature as a sort of bank of resources you know that 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 approach you know we can see is 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 rapidly becoming a kind of a flat earth attitude, if you like. I mean, you know, we, we know that, you know, if you walk west for long enough, you know, you're going to realise the world is round in the same way as you keep extracting resources and keep polluting, you know, the ecosystems that that, you, that you're using for those resources, you know, sooner or later, you don't have those resources. Um, you know, so so that there's a very kind of basic factual reality check involved in in, in what we're doing. And and um, while I completely appreciate the, the MSP's contribution, I think it was Rachel who was talking about you know the time taken to transition this is very much um something that you know we believe is hugely important and it's one of the reasons that our campaign aims to um to move to progress this this crime at the international level um is is because the you know a transition period is needed um, in the sense that transition policies need to be put in place. Um, the corporate sectors involved, including the, the, the textile and fashion industry, need to have, need to be able to evolve compliance pathways in order to fit a new ground rule. I mean, right now, you can't go to a government, as, as we all know, you can't go to a government and, and, and ask for a permit for your new business that's going to involve killing a few hundred people. I mean, you just can't do it. It's criminal, and not only that, but it's completely morally unacceptable. But you can go and get a permit to, you know, I don't know, uh, drill for oil and gas, um, engage in industrial fishing of the kind that, you know, destroys whole swathes of the seabed. Um, you can, you can, um, if you don't even need permits to use a lot of toxic pesticides. Um, and so what that what that kind of illustrates is where our attitude towards nature sits. In other words, you know, our legal system and our kind of uh, the, the sort of moral framework that we associate largely with criminal law in our dominant Western way of thinking, um, puts people and property above the relationship with nature. And we're just now, you know, we're now kind of really beginning to realize on a global scale how dangerous that is in the long term. Um, and so there, there is this, there is this, this need, and, and then I think the need is quite widely acknowledged, you know, the need to move in a new direction. Um, but it's actually very difficult to do that if the parameters are not in place. And I think one of the reasons for this is that finance and, and you know, the, the, what kind of, you know, the flow, if you like, of our economic system is, is finance. And, and, and it flows very much like water. So it, it goes where it's allowed. It goes down the path of least resistance. And so, for example, one of the issues that was just brought up around cost um, is, is something that, that comes up a lot in our discussions because the production, you know, of the, the sort of mass production of cheap clothes as well as cheap food you know it's the same thing you know it, it may cost less 
in the supermarket, but the real cost in terms of what the implications are for the detriment to ecosystems, for the social impacts, for the, the uh, often even human rights impacts, all of these things, you know, are simply not taken into account. They're externalized completely. Um, and so, you know, for example, I might spend twice the money on an organic um, product, uh, food-wise, for example, in the supermarket, um, you know, which, where, where in fact the the cost is in a way more honest because it, it's it's all in you know it's included in the cost the the way that the that the uh, food is produced whereas if I buy something cheap and mass produced that's been you know flown I don't know how many thousands of miles to arrive on that shelf those costs are not reflected in that price and it's the environment and the local communities that are suffering um, and the, and where that is not taken into account. Um, but uh, but as, as I said, as, as, as um, the MSP brought up earlier, you know, it, a, a transition period is important um, and it's one of the reasons that we aim for the international level because it's very difficult to change a ground rule like this overnight. Um, it, it, and, and, you know, we can honestly admit that if that you know, happened overnight, you know, in a given country or globally, you know, it, it would create chaos. But what's important is to understand that actually a parameter like this, which, which we do see as a sort of safety well, we almost see this as a kind of health and safety law for the planet. Um, this has to be seen approaching um, in order to, you know, allow those transitions to take place. And I think it's a little bit misleading to uh, imply that it's a very slow process that, of change that's needed. It's not a very slow process. Some time is needed, but we don't have a lot of time. And I think if the pandemic has shown us anything over the last year, it has shown that where necessary, governments and corporate sector can move very fast if they need to. You know, if it's a question of public health, and of course it's not going to be that long before the climate and ecological crisis is a question of public health, not just for those in the global south where it's already impacting hugely in a number of different contexts, but also for us in the wealthy north. So um, I think that, that again, you know, this sort of comes back to the, the sort of reality check idea, if you like. Um, but I also think that, that this uh, conversation has been very interesting in terms of showing where a new ground rule like simply like, like, like putting serious damage of nature below that criminal moral red line actually acts not just as a stick in terms of a deterrent, an enforceable deterrent, but also as, as a carrot, if you like, um, as a kind of a bridging piece. Because it's, it's, I mean, we see it almost as a sort of strategic intervention, almost an acupuncture needle type intervention, you know, where, you know, we say that the, you know, damaging nature is as serious as damaging people and property. And therefore it takes us in a bit of a new direction and having a clear parameter. And I know this from having spent time as an entrepreneur in my own past, having clear parameters is an excellent way to unleash ingenuity and innovation. And that's something that Kate Fletcher also brought up earlier in this discussion. Um, and so there's a way in which when you can see this new rule coming as you know, in, in that sort of industry and sector, it really stimulates those policy changes, those subsidies, those uh, th that new direction of way of thinking. It, uh, as Kate was saying, you know, the, the Einstein thing of the new approach, you know, not trying to use the same old ways, but you know, it, a particular limit being put in place um, can help enormously in driving those things in the new direction and 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 that's sorely needed because at the moment if, at least if you campaign for human rights or social justice you know that there's a basic ground rule you know mass murder and torture are not permitted but there isn't an equivalent in the environmental sphere and that's what a law of ecocide could supply so i mean that's a very you know sort of broad perhaps um a series of thoughts around this but very very open to uh, any specific questions thank you Wow, thank you so much, Jojo. So much information there. Before we go to questions, I'm just going to go to uh, Natasha, who wants to just quickly tell us about the meeting next month. Thank you, everyone. It is truly an honour to be in the room with MSPs, the panellists, and the attendees working on small sustainable ideas and labels right at this moment. I love my clothes and whether it be my second skin tracky pants or the outfit that I put on that lifts my self-esteem. And isn't it awesome that Scotland and the UK are global leaders in design? 
But what isn't so great is the dis disconnection from responsibility of supply chains and these gorgeous designs are being made and where these gorgeous designs are being made, sorry. Whether we're aware of it or not, we're all part of the problem. The Modern Savory Act 2015 has highlighted the lack of respect some companies have producing lip service uh, statements or not bothering at all. In 2018, the Environmental Audit Committee made recommendations to Parliament. Devastatingly, not one was implemented. Shout out to Mary Craig here, who was amazing at leading that. It's not just the workers that need our assistance, it's the suppliers and business owners that are working legally and ethically to level the playing field, ensuring the sustainability of legal and ethical production in the UK and globally. Quite simply, if a company doesn't want to take responsibility of their supply chain, they don't have to. It is simply left up to their level of morals versus margins. In the words of Jojo earlier, what are the ground rules? Without government intervention, we will never be able to shift this needle. Coming up in the next cross-parliamentary event on the 23rd of July, we'll be in conversation with Fiona Gooch from Tradecraft, who is instrumental in the most recent Environmental Audit Committee, championing a garment trading adjudicator, focusing on responsible purchasing practices of businesses, and Jenny Holloway from Fashion Enter, a manufacturer that is working to ethical and legal standards. So how's that done? I'll see you on the 23rd. Thanks, Natasha. Jojo, thank you so much for your presentation as well. I see that Sarah's got her hand up. Sarah, do you want to um, speak now? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, uh, it's been fantastic. I wanted to make a couple of comments about um, things we could maybe pick up in the Scottish Parliament after today. Because um, we had a really good debate this week on climate change and Monica uh, raised the issue of fast fashion. Um, but we had a discussion about the circular economy bill that is meant to be coming to Parliament soon. So we are pushing the government um, in Scotland really hard to do that. And we, we've definitely got some degree of cross party agreement um, because um, Maurice Golden, who was at one of our previous meetings and Monica um, are and myself are very keen that we get that circular economy bill because there's the issues that Kate talked about, about uh, reuse, uh, recycling, remaking, um, getting the best use out of the clothes we've already produced. And then there's issues about what happens when things aren't good enough for charity shops or when people just chuck them. So waste was, is was issued, raised in parliament yesterday. Um, and the, the level of waste that we export as a country is absolutely shocking. So on the one hand, we're buying cheap stuff from um, Eastern countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan. But on the other hand, we're also exporting stuff. So we buy stuff very cheaply with no regard to the producers. And then we just send it back and let them deal with it. So I think the second point I was thinking about was partly in the points Jojo's just made about ecocide. We've got COP26 coming up this year. And I'm not saying you're going to get ecocide integrated and passed by COP, but it's that kind of chain of responsibility from us as consumers, the people that make clothes, all the suppliers, and then what happens to stuff afterwards. So I think a joined up conversation um, would be good. And I think the fast fashion meetings you've been doing, Katie, are actually going to help in terms of making sure that clothes are part of that agenda. And my final thought is about what government does in procurement can actually influence um, supply chains as well. And that could be central and local government. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Um, I realise that we've got to 11 o'clock and that some people will be leaving now at 11. Um, I do just want to take this time to say thank you from the bottom, bottom of my heart to Kate and Jojo for being here and for bringing such insight to Scotland and to our policy makers. We are happy to be here for a bit longer. I know that I've promised Michelle, to, um, who's been waiting patiently to ask questions, but I appreciate that um, people will have to leave. And so I just want to say an official goodbye, but also uh, Michelle, quickly come in, say your question. And also Jojo, I don't know if you want to say anything in, res in response to what Sarah's just said before Michelle asks. 
just briefly to you know acknowledge the importance and the spotlight that's, that's going to be on Scotland this year um, and the, you know with the, with the COP talks um, and also to say that you know we realize that the, the work that we're engaged in is a bit of a slow burner it will take some time we're looking at a sort of time scale of perhaps four to five years to put this in place at the international level but what we're absolutely you know um, hoping for um, from as many countries as possible is an in principle support for this in terms of you know that's a relatively easy political uh, political step in the sense that it doesn't imply uh, the need, need for immediate action because of course a number of states will be needed quite a large number to really move this forward at the international level so simply an expression of this is an interesting conversation we're following this we're, we're interested in, in 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 the development of this is is a really um you know in, important uh, flag to be raising at this time thank you thanks Jojo and um <laughs> You're exceptionally proud that um, your uh, co-founder, Polly Higgins, originated from Scotland as well. And we would love to honour um, Polly's memory by, by seeing Ecoside being supported by the Scottish Parliament. So thank you very much. Michelle. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me, can you? We can hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. OK, well... First of all, I want to say what a pleasure it has been to listen to Kate Fletcher, Jojo, everyone else that's contributed today. Um, I really would like to raise the point that Kate mentioned, which was about communities and like communities um, approach to recycled and you know, like disposable fashion. And I know that from coming from Fife, the community I live in, it's very, everyone has to have a different outfit. And so many of these online, you know, shops, sorry if I sound a bit nervous, but they are so accessible. So it's about changing that ethos. And I really believe in early years because I feel it, it, like, you know, that's where perhaps it would be a good approach. Do you understand what I mean? Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. Um, to start from the very beginning from uh, preschool in learning yes. how to reuse our clothes and, and yeah. So thank you for that. Yeah, Is I have a lot any... of ideas going on, so. Kate, Just hoping we get the support from Five. Thanks so much, Michelle. Kate, would you like to finish off with any comments? Oh, I've, I've enjoyed myself hugely and also feel really uh, excited about some about the prospect of, of the connecting work because it, that's exactly where and how things will begin to happen. And then also the contextualizing of what we're saying, which currently is like sitting you know, in cyberspace somewhere and really bringing it to the, spe the specificity of a location here and now. And that's, that's why, I mean, that's one of the benefits of having you know, a, a Scottish parliament specifically because the specific details of a place can be really dealt with there. So I think that's, that's amazing. I think connecting the work of Ecoside uh, through potentially fashion is a really intriguing way. I mean, everybody, quite frankly, just is obsessed about fashion. And if we can find a way to drive the eco side measure, measure through an example, a worked example like fashion and like others, but it's a really incredible way, I think, to do that. And I, I am full of hope about, about that prospect and also full of fear about, about all of the other questions that will come. But perhaps what we need to do is we need to start. And this is the most exciting prospect. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. And I'm just gonna leave um, the floor open for any MSPs, any policymakers who want to commit to any action that they would like to take as a result of this discussion just now. Is there anyone that would like to say how they would like to take this forward? Karen, I think the uh, circular economy is a dead good way to do this because it's 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 going to be measurable 
and it's a debate that will come up in Parliament and we can insert this into it. Um, but I think also this, I've just mentioned that we got an amendment passed about the school curriculum and climate change. And that could, we could link in that issue about um, clothes, fast fashion, where stuff comes from. Because sometimes when you change young people's attitudes or give them information, they actually go and change their parents' attitudes and that wider society issue as well that was talked about earlier on. So I think, yeah, just keep, but the information you've given us today is really useful in the chat box. Um, so that, that will be at least two hours of chasing those <laughs> web links, but it's been dead useful. Thanks. Thanks so much. And a great connection with what Michelle raised earlier about um, education and young people as well. I'm going to close the meeting now. Um, Again, thank you to each and every one of you who's come and shown the support and an interest in this topic. This film will be made available and we will be sending you emails so that you can access that. And uh, yeah, we look forward to seeing you next month on the 23rd of July for those of you who can make that. Again, thank you again to Kate and Joe in particular and goodbye to everyone. Thank you, bye.